Greetings to you from Botswana. I'd like to talk to you today a little bit about when Jesus said, by their fruit you shall know them. He was saying that there would be false prophets that would come, that would, be, that would look like sheep on the outside, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. And this would apply for false prophets and false teachers. But the passage I'll read is from Luke, verses, uh, chapter 6, verses 43 and 44. For a good tree bringeth forth not, fruit, not forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by his own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. I only wish to put the, uh, point this out, and that is many times we are looking at the fruit, but we have just such a thin layer of discernment. I mean, we're really not looking at this as we should. We see someone doing a good work and we say, oh, they're good. Uh, they're Christian or they're approved of God. They're a good person. But we know that Jesus said there are none good but one, that is God. When he is pointing out, when Jesus is pointing out by their fruit you shall know them, he is also pointing out the tree or the plant that it comes from. Notice that he says, for of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. So we understand, if we understand what the, the plant is also, we will know that it's not good. You know, this doesn't mean that the unsaved don't do good work sometimes. Of course they do. You know, but it doesn't mean that they're already children of God before they have repented of their sins and received the remission of their sins through Jesus Christ. I want you to hear this. This is from, from Genesis chapter 3. And of course, most of us would remember that first sin, as God had commanded Adam and Eve not to eat from uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, but the serpent came and he tempted Eve. So when Eve was about to give in, and as a matter of fact, she wasn't named Eve just yet, but uh, Genesis 3 verse 6 says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave unto her husband with her, who was with her and he did eat. So you see what the Bible was saying here. She looked at the fruit and it looked good. It was very appealing to her, but she knew the tree. And so she should not have partaken of this. For God had said that when you eat of this tree, that you will die. And as we see in retrospect, we see that they began to die. Before that, they would live forever. But after they ate of this tree, then, then death entered into their bodies and they began, and began decaying. Now, one thing is, though, I want to give you some examples of this. Because what happens is people are following a lot of good leaders. Uh, they look good. They look respectable. And while especially here in, in Africa, respect is just incredible. There is such an undue respect of persons here. It's, it's hard for me to, to get a grip on. Uh, it's almost like a class separation. But we need to be holding up the word of God as our standard. And that's the important thing, knowing the word of God. And this is what we have to rely on. Okay, so just don't take it for granted that everyone is walking the way they should. Remember that the Bereans in Acts 17, 11, the Bereans were searching the scriptures daily to see if the things that they were being told by the apostles were so. Remember that. So I just wanted to give you a few examples that that uh, I have been living with as the Lord has compelled me, you know, just to share what we are dealing with here. Number one is just the there's a great number of false prophecies. And I've been seeing this all over the place. How do you know they're false prophecies? You can know this even from the start. Number one, the prophecies by and large today are all positive. They are all flattering and positive. If you will notice in the Bible, the prophecies of the Bible coming from God were not flattering. Okay. Even in the times when God was promising something good, there, was, there were always conditions with it. Even as he was promising 
how he would bless the temple after Solomon had had built it. He also said, and you know, in, in the same breath, he's saying that if you forsake me and you turn from me, I will just cast this temple out of my sight. There were always conditions to it. And so that the, the prophecies of scripture were either balanced or they were negative. But the ones you tend to hear today are mostly positive and they often contradict scripture. Uh, for example, there was one, uh, one pastor we had seen and, and no names will be mentioned, no gossip will be had. One pastor had uh, a prophecy on his site for his church. He said something like, uh, everyone reading this, you know, for a season, you will have no troubles. Satan's darts won't get through to you. You'll be in good health, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I typed a response and I said, if this is true, then I'm not a child of God. Because Jesus said that as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. We read in Acts 14, 22, that we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God and that we glory in tribulations, according to Romans 5, 1, because it helps us to grow. And so here he is telling people that they're not going to go through any trials. And I automatically knew this is not, this is not uh, a godly prophecy. And so I typed the comment to which he, he, uh, he got it pretty promptly. He deleted it and he blocked me from commenting anymore. He had my information. He could have contacted me. We could have had a discussion, but he didn't. This will tell you an awful lot about a person, how they react to rebuke from the word of God. As we see, uh, as I see, there was another uh, instance, another church we went to. I went to because I actually managed to have a, a long discussion with one of the junior pastors. It was an informal thing. And uh, I wasn't too thrilled about going there, but I thought at least I could see a service to see if there's any, if there's any meat. I didn't expect there to be. Uh, because right above, right above the stage, right above the platform, there was this big, ba this big banner that said, by reason of raw power, I will rediscover my destiny. As you will notice, Jesus is nowhere in that banner. There is nothing about sin or repentance or Jesus or anything. It's all about pride. It's all about myself. And believe me, uh, I only wish that the service could have disappointed that banner, but unfortunately it was, it was too much just the same. It was incredible. And you could tell, uh, for example, we were, I was writing down notes. Uh, one thing the pastor said at one point was, Satan is no big deal. Certainly doesn't seem that way from scripture, does it? Especially in passages like Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 18, where it's telling us to take on the armor of God because Satan is coming after us, or from 1 Peter 5, uh, verses 8 and 9, that Satan is going about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. It sounds like Satan is kind of a big deal. Obviously, he, is, uh, he can be countered well by prayer and by the power of God, but he will attack. That's just, that's the way it is for a Christian. Okay, he also, he also said, sin is not powerful. Well, has anyone read Romans chapter 7? How, how Paul is writing that he has discovered another law in his members that is bringing him captive to sin. This is Paul who is writing this. And here he is saying that sin is not powerful. He also said at one point, uh, and this was the only point during his entire service, that he actually mentioned Jesus. What a shame. And he said that he, uh, how can I say it? He was putting down the Bible's description. He didn't say he was putting down the Bible, but he was putting down the description of Jesus as a lamb. He said, Jesus is better than that. He's no lamb. He's better than that. Well, I just looked in the Bible and I found that 26 times, 26 times in the book of Revelation, Jesus is referred to as the lamb, the sacrificed lamb that was slain. We also find it four other times in the New Testament. And then two times even in the Old Testament. That's 32 times. 32 times. What is this pastor talking about? This is a proud man. And uh, it was very disappointing in those ways. But you can see, this is my point. 
If you know the scripture, or at least take up time to look up scripture later, you can verify where such a person is coming from. They may look good and respectable to a lot of people, but it really isn't that way. And then one of the uh, recent encounters that I had, I had a person contact and said they wanted me to check out a video because he was very impressed with the video and thought this was a great thing. And so uh, I checked out this video and the person did not care for my response to the video. Uh, I will try to say it in a way that will not indicate any person. Uh, the person in the video was supposed to be a Christian. He was supposed to be instructing others into how to live for Christ. That was the, I take it, the, the banner, uh, the category under which he was supposed to be. And so what he was trying to do was he was trying to push helping people, uh, helping people who were down on their luck, who had bad circumstances and this and that. And certainly the Bible tells us to do that. Uh, Jesus told us to do that. We see that this in a number of places of scripture. But as Christians, the thing that we need to do so much is we need to lift up the cross. We need to tell people about their sinful separation from God and what Jesus did to, to rectify that. This does not mean if we go and see someone who is hungry or in need, that we don't try to help them that way also. But if that's all you do, that falls short of the gospel. And this is basically what I was saying, uh, because this person did a very, very good work for a poor homeless man, a man who had chosen the condition he was in, really, basically, but he had compassion on him. And yet during this entire encounter with both the man and with those who interacted with him, who were, were saying, wow, why are you doing such a good thing? He never mentioned Jesus Christ, not even once. He never even said, well, you know, Jesus died for my sins. He gave me love for my fellow man. I want to help him. He didn't say that. He said instead, well, why shouldn't I? Why shouldn't I do it? He's a, he's a fellow human being. And so you understand this really falls short. There were a number of ways that this really fell short, but that's just in brief. It's simple. You know, to do this, to do this work is fine. And even to say it's a part of your Christian testimony, that's fine also. But during this guy's whole time with this man, he never told him how to get saved. Don't we remember what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? Don't we remember the example of the beggar Lazarus and the rich man Luke, uh, the rich man uh, from Luke chapter 16? If you look in verse 25, you'll see this is after they had died. And you see that the that Lazarus is with Abraham in heaven and the rich man is in hell. And Abraham says simply, he says, remember that in your life you had your good things and Lazarus his evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. What does that tell you? That it's far better, far better to be, to, to die in poverty than to be in riches and be sent to hell. This should make sense to people. And so if we are helping people materially, but not showing them uh, their spiritual need, we have fallen short. So the bottom line is when you're looking at the fruit, okay, don't just look at the superficial fruit that you might see. That can really sway you. Wow, this is a good work. But look at the tree. Look at what's being said. Compare it to what the scripture says. Don't follow men, follow God through his holy word, the King James Bible. May God bless.